The intentional infliction of emotional distress is usually the fourth of the intentional torts taught in a 1L torts class. The intentional torts of assault, battery, and false imprisonment protect one's right to control one's person. Trespass to land, trespass to chattels, and conversion protects one's right to exclusively control one's property, both personal and real. IIED protects something similar but distinct. IIED protects one's right from intentional or reckless emotional disturbance or abuse from another. It is important to keep in mind that physical harm is not necessary for liability to attach under this tort, only the presence of severe emotional damage. So how is IIED defined? Let's take a look at that next. Welcome to Roman Matter. This lesson will explore the intentional tort known as the intentional infliction of emotional distress, also called IIED. We will cover how the tort is defined, examine its elements, and go over a few examples. A quick word of caution, this course is intended to answer academic questions only. These materials are intended to reinforce your legal education or to satisfy the curious layperson, not legal advice. And with that, let's get to it. The Restatement Third of Torts, Section 46, defines the circumstances under which an actor may be held liable for the intentional or reckless infliction of emotional harm. Section 46 states that an actor who by extreme and outrageous conduct intentionally or recklessly causes severe emotional harm to another is subject to liability for that emotional harm. And if the emotional harm causes bodily harm, also for that bodily harm. In other words, to make a prima facie case for IIED, the defendant must have intentionally or recklessly engaged in extreme and outrageous behavior causing the plaintiff severe emotional distress. The viewer should take note, this is the only intentional tort where the defendant's intent can establish itself by the actor's actual intent or by his recklessness to cause serious emotional harm. Let's take a closer look at the definition's critical pieces. This requirement is integral to all intentional torts. Simply put, the tortfeasor must have acted with intent. But again, you must remember, this tort's name aside, recklessness can fulfill the intent requirement as well. The Restatement Second of Torts, Section 1, states that a person acts with the intent to produce a consequence if a. the person acts with the purpose of producing that consequence or b. the person acts knowing that the consequence is substantially certain to result. Regarding recklessness, the Restatement Second of Torts, Section 2, states that a person acts recklessly in engaging in conduct if a. the person knows the risk of harm created by the conduct or knows facts that make the risk obvious to another in the person's situation and b. the precaution that would eliminate or reduce the risk involves burdens that are so slight relative to the magnitude of the risk as to render the person's failure to adopt the precaution a demonstration of the person's indifference to the risk. Section 46 states that the actor must utilize, quote, extreme and outrageous conduct to cause the harm it regulates against. So what is extreme and outrageous conduct? Well, the Restatement Third of Torts, Section 46, Comment D, states that extreme and outrageous requires both that the character of the conduct be outrageous and that the conduct be sufficiently unusual to be extreme. This is somewhat circular, but such a determination will naturally be a fact-focused analysis. Section 46, Comment D, addresses extreme and outrageous conduct. It states that, whether an actor's conduct is extreme and outrageous depends on the facts of each case, including the relationship of the parties, whether the actor abused a position of authority over the other person, whether the other person was especially vulnerable and the actor knew of that vulnerability, the motivation of the actor, and lastly, whether the conduct was repeated or prolonged. So think of behaviors or actions that a defendant might use to shock the plaintiff and unsettle them to a great degree. There is an unlimited number of interactions that can occur between parties, but courts will usually find behavior that transcends the bounds of decency tolerated in society to be quote-unquote extreme and outrageous. In the examples that follow, we illustrate some of those behaviors. For liability to attach to the defendant, 
It is not necessary that the plaintiff suffer physical harm as a result of the defendant's actions. Instead, for liability to attach, only severe emotional distress is necessary. Okay, let's talk through some of this with three examples. This example is adapted from the Restatement of Law, Third, Torts, Liability for Physical and Emotional Harm, Section 46, Illustration 4. Patricia, a lawyer, and Dan, a cop, are platonic friends. To save money, they decided to move into the same apartment together as roommates. Over the course of the next year or so, Dan started to develop feelings for Patricia. Unfortunately for Dan, the feeling was not mutual. To keep things from getting awkward, Patricia packed her things and moved out into her own place. But Dan didn't take the hint. Over the following months, Dan started stopping by Patricia's new place in his police cruiser to keep an eye on her. Patricia noticed this behavior and asked him to stop, but Dan didn't. Patricia started dating Howard, a fellow attorney from her firm. When Dan found out about this, his nocturnal vigils turned into phone calls and then insults directed at Patricia for what he perceived as being slighted by her. Again, Patricia told him to stop, but Dan only escalated his conduct. At night, he'd call her dozens of times, sometimes even running his lights and sirens to harass and bother Patricia. The fact that Dan was a cop only made reporting him that much more difficult. To top it off, Patricia began to suffer from panic attacks, anxiety, and night sweats. Under these facts, it's clear that Dan may be held liable for IIED. Even without Patricia's development of physical symptoms, Dan's intentional actions were outrageous and extreme by any standard. He was a police officer, entrusted with authority to enforce the law, and he intentionally abused that privilege. He did this for several months, and those actions resulted in severe emotional harm to Patricia. Again, this is a clear example of IIED in action. Now let's adjust our fact pattern to illustrate IIED with reckless intent. Let's work with the same facts as in example one involving Patricia and Dan. Except in this example, despite Dan's behavior, Patricia's boyfriend Howard proposed after a few months. Even after the marriage, Dan continued to harass and bother the couple. Before the marriage and shortly after all of this started, Patricia called Dan's employer, the local police department, to report the behavior. She made several reports, sometimes a few a week over the next year. Nothing seemed able to convince the police department to take Dan's behavior seriously. One night, unbeknownst to Dan, Patricia was away on business. Howard, however, was coming home, and Dan wanted to give him a scare. Dan got out of his cruiser, approached Howard, and threatened to kill him for marrying Patricia. Howard was severely shaken. Dan stayed outside his home all night. Under these facts, not only is Dan liable to Howard for IIED, but Dan's employer, the police department, is likely liable as well. The department's liability stems from his recklessness regarding the reports it received about Dan's behavior toward Patricia and Howard. Okay, so that's a fairly straightforward example of reckless IIED in action. Let's make a slight change from example two. If, instead of Patricia being away on business, let's imagine that evening she and Howard were arriving home from dinner. Dan got out of his cruiser and approached the couple. He confronted them, immediately raising his baton and brought it down on Howard. He began beating Howard mercilessly in front of Patricia, who screamed at him to stop. Dan only stopped once Howard stopped moving, knocked unconscious from the blows. Under these facts, Dan is liable for the severe emotional harm Patricia endured from his extreme and outrageous behavior toward her husband, Howard. Howard, among other torts, can also hold Dan liable for the IIED he suffered during Dan's battery. Remember, the elements necessary to prove Patricia's claim requires that 1. The plaintiff, Patricia in this case, be present when the injury occurred to the other's person, and Howard is in this instance. 2. That the plaintiff, again Patricia, be a close relative of the third person, which she is, and 3. That the defendant, Dan, know that the plaintiff was present and closely related to the third person. All of those elements are present in this fact pattern. To sum it up, an actor can be liable for IIED if he, through intentional or reckless actions, engaged in extreme and outrageous conduct resulting in severe emotional distress to the plaintiff. Under certain conditions, a third party with a special relationship to the injured person can also hold the actor responsible for IIED. That's it for this lesson. If you found it helpful, give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. 
leave some comments below and check back often for more content. As always, thank you for visiting Roman Manor and have a lovely day.